then I got the call to say I've been longlisted back in 2016. I was painting a lady's toilet in an accountant's office. Half an hour later, I'm talking to the literary editor of The Guardian, which was quite an unusual thing for me at the time. Welcome to the Booker Price podcast with me, Joe Hamia. And me, James Walton. And today we have for you Booker's Book of the Month for September, His Bloody Project by Graham McRae Burnett, shortlisted in 2016 when the winner was a book James and I have actually discussed a few episodes ago, The Sellout by Paul Beatty. The other shortlisted books were Hot Milk by Deborah Levy, Eileen by Atessa Moshveg, All That Man Is by David Saloy, and Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Theon. And that year, the judging panel was particularly fantastic. It was chaired by historian Amanda Foreman, and another member was now Nobel Prize winning author Abdul Razak Gurna. But his bloody project, in fact, sold more than any of them, and has remained extremely popular ever since. So we're delighted to be talking about it today, and even more delighted to say that we're joined by its author. So it's a big Booker Prize podcast welcome to Graham McRae Burnett. Thanks so much for doing this, Graham. Great to have you with us. Uh, My great pleasure, James. Great to be with you both, uh, James and Joe. Uh, Looking forward to chatting. Where are you joining us from? I am from Glasgow, and um, I don't think any of your listeners will believe this. It's Glasgow in September, (laughs) and it's actually too hot. I have never done an interview in shorts before, um, and I probably never will do again. So... Because His Bloody Project is our book of the month, even though it's been a while since it came out, I was wondering if you could give us a a summary of the novel. Uh, Sure, absolutely. Um, His Bloody Project um, is set in a very small uh, village in the northwest highlands of Scotland in 1869. And it tells the story of how a young crofter uh, called Rodney McRae, 17 years old, uh, kills his neighbour, Lachlan McKenzie, and uh, two other people. And the book is told mainly in the form of Roddy McRae's memoir, which he writes in prison after his arrest, but also in the form of a number of other documents, such as a psychiatric report and some newspaper reports and postmortems and so on. So it's a kind of almost a dossier. And the, I really wanted the reader to read these various accounts of what has occurred and be able to make up his or her own mind about what's actually gone on. For the benefit of the listener, could you explain to us what a crofter is? Uh, Yes, a crofter was basically a a kind of peasant farmer who worked the land that they didn't own. And um, they were kind of subsistence farmers in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century in Scotland. And then, of course, it climaxes in the trial as well, which you recreate from newspaper reports and and Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Now, I believe the novel had its genesis quite a long time before when you came across a book called... uh, IPA Riviere, is that, is that, is that, would that be fair? And do you want to tell us about that book? Because it might not be familiar to everybody. Yeah, and the book uh, did have its origins uh, many, many years ago when I was a student uh, here in Glasgow, at Glasgow University. I was a student of literature and I came across a book edited by Michel Foucault called IPA Riviere, having slaughtered my mother, my brother and sister. And uh, this was a book um, which was actually a dossier of documents about a case in France in 1835 of a young peasant called Pierre Riviere who killed three members of his own family and then remarkably wrote a memoir about it. And this, this was a book that fascinated me from the moment I ever came across it because it was, it was really the contrast between the, the great violence of the acts committed by this young man and then the relative eloquence in the way he wrote about them. As I said, um, his bloody project consists, about two thirds of the book is my murderer, Roderick McRae's memoir. So I was really, I really took the sort of template of the IPR Riviere book and tried to recreate it in the in the highlands of Scotland um, in the 19th century. And that was, um, it was, it was quite a long time before you read that book and, and before you, you wrote yours, so, which was published in your, in, in your mid forties, I think. Um, That's right. So, uh, yeah. what, what happened in between, Graham? <laughs> By a lot of procrastination. Um, I think, <laughs> like many writers, I'm a terrible procrastinator. Um, as I say, I was studying, I did film, film studies in English literature at Glasgow University back in the 80s. And then I spent about 10 years traveling around as a English as a foreign language teacher. I worked in Prague and Portugal and France and London. And uh, then I sort of fell into working in television for about 10 years. Um, mostly as a researcher on documentaries and so on. What kind of documentaries? Uh, any, any we might uh, know? 
Um, they were mostly kind of arts documentaries, uh, mostly for BBC Scotland, Scottish literature documentaries. But um, yeah, I kind of I lost my job about when I was about forty, and um, what I'd always wanted to do, I'd always been writing. And I'd always wanted, my ambition in life was to publish a novel. So um, I'd got reached the age of 40 and thought, okay, okay, Graham, come on, now's the time. Um, I had a wee bit of money from the work in the in TV and I was able to kind of fund myself for about a year. And I wrote, well, actually it took me about three years, but I wrote a book called The Disappearance of Adele Bedeau, um, which was then picked up by still my publisher, Saraband Books. And uh, most, a lot of people thought that his bloody project was my first novel, which is perfectly reasonable because the disappearance of Adele Bordeaux was not a bestseller. I mean, it did, you know, it did okay for a first novel, but I was by no means making a living as a writer before um, the nice old Booker Prize came along. I heard you were doing sort of painting and decorating when the news came through that you'd been longlisted. I was, I was, I was working as a painter and decorator to fund myself as a writer. Um, and it's absolutely true that when I got the call to say I've been longlisted back in 2016, I was painting a lady's toilet in an accountant's office in Kilmarnock, my hometown. And my publisher um, said, you know, you really need to get back up the road. And um, I came back up to Glasgow and half an hour later, I'm talking to the literary editor of The Guardian, which was quite an unusual thing for me at the time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean... I, I don't know how many copies his bloody project had sold at that point, but it, certainly less than 100, you know, and um, it was completely transformative uh, for the fortunes of that book um, to be to be long list, first long listed. That, that gave it an enormous boost because, as you all know, uh, publishers abroad are looking at the long list. And if you're a, a writer, an unknown writer, as I was at that point, um, you know, you're going to get some offers. And I immediately had offers of publication from various countries in Europe and Australia. And that that in itself was transformative. Uh, but then when you get on the long, on the book, on the shortlist, you know, of course, that's all ra ramped up to another level. And, um, you know, the book's gone on to sell. I, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, maybe close to 200,000 copies in the UK, um, which, you know, for a book of that nature, I think is pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, you say that Saraband is still your publisher. I think they publish case study as well. And I'm so fascinated by that because I think a lot of authors, you know, will go for indies with their first novel, their first two novels, and then they make it big and they sell their backlist to someone like Penguin or Orion. You know, um, I'd love to know why you stayed with a smaller independent press like Saraband. You know, so I, I'm not, it was an incredibly difficult decision for me to stay with Saraband because, of course, you, as an author, you always sort of, wonder what it's like on the other side of the fence of the, the yeah, glamorous yeah, yeah. London publishers. I imagine they're drinking champagne, you know, from half past 10 in the morning and yeah, lunch, canapes, lunching know. at the Ivy. Yeah. Yeah. And having, having garden parties. Um, but um, I also know a lot of authors who maybe started off with a two book deal with a, you know, big publisher. And then if the first book doesn't go so well, then they don't, the publisher doesn't get behind the second book. And those, those authors are maybe, then later on in their career, struggling to find a publisher. And um, I think I'm a kind of indie author, and I think it suits me to be with indie publishers. Were any countries you were particularly surprised that they took to the book? His Bloody Project's been translated into about 20 languages. And, you know, as I said at the outset, it's a book about a village in Scotland in 1869. So to me, the book, that book, Travelling Around the World, has been absolutely... A, an amazing, remarkable thing, and what I've found, you know, I've been, I, I've been to China, I've been to Russia, I've been to India, I've been to Australia and the USA, and people in the book find parallels with situations in their own country, whether that's the treatment of Aboriginal people in Australia, whether it's the treatment of serfs in Russia, whether it was the treatment of sharecroppers in in the USA. They find some way to latch on to the story, which is I wrote about a, a Scottish crofter. Um, and that that to me is remarkable. You know, that people find uh, find something in a book that is so ostensibly alien to them. And it's an amazing thing that literature can do, I think. You know, when we read work from, uh, you know, countries that we've never visited and so on. Yeah, and, and uh, meanwhile, back in Scotland, is it true there's a tourist trail at the at the village? It would it would be an exaggeration to say there's a tourist trail, but um, 
as as you probably know, my mother's from the west uh, west of Ross, where the book is set, and I grew up there very frequently. And there's a very beautiful village called Applecross, which is mentioned frequently in the book. And Applecross has always been quite a tourist destination. It's a stunning, stunning place. Um, Kildui is at a backwater, well away from Applecross. Um, but when I'm up there now, there there is almost always one one or two people who are up there, and they've been brought. And they've they've got they're visiting the area because of the book, and they go to Kaldui and they walk from one village to the other, you know, in um, to replicate the walk of Roderick McRae as he goes off to kill Lachlan Mackenzie. And it may be, you know, slightly annoying to some of the locals there. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny village at, at the end of a dead end, so it's not a place that people normally pass through. I'm, I'm not sure how popular I am in Phil Dewey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think this is a, a great chance to segue into talking about the book itself. And if we're talking about travel, I think we should, uh, a nice place to start would be with J.B. Thompson, whose travels and the borderlands of uh, lunacy is excerpted as, as one of the documents in the book. Um and uh, and his testimony, of course, also appears in, in the trial. I think he's quite a central figure to the book in a way because um, he's, he's a man who makes a lot of pronouncements, whether in his own writing or at the trial, which are liable to uh, change the reader's mind or alter their perceptions of characters. Um, he has many theories on kind of the inbred nature of criminality, you know, low people who are born to be criminals inherently. He has many theories or, you know, one big kind of uh, theory that kind of shakes the book about what happened in the Mackenzie household the day that Roderick went to kill Lachlan and some of his family. Um, and to me, um, Thompson actually seems really close to the figure of a true crime podcaster or super fan um, who is sort of utterly convinced that their conspiracies are fact. Um, and I find that really interesting because your novel took off around a kind of true crime boom as well. I was wondering if you could talk to us about how you view the ethics of, of a figure like um, J. Bruce Thompson or indeed the sort of true crime podcaster who may be like inherently drawn to your novel to, you know, what actually happened, trying to piece it together? Um, well, first of all, on James Bruce Thompson, uh, he was a real person, as you may know. Um, and he was he was a great discovery. I, I, I love research. Yeah, and as I said, uh, I worked in television as a researcher. So I had a reasonably good skill set as a researcher. You know, I went to the archives and in, in in, in Edinburgh, and I read the, read the case notes to, for 19th century murder cases, and I just I came across um, an excerpt from some of James Bruce Thompson's own writing in an anthology of er, early criminology, and James Bruce Thompson was the Surgeon General at Perth Prison in Scotland at the time, and this was where Scotland's criminally insane were held, and so he had this kind of he had this kind of laboratory to study in, in his eyes, you know, the causes of criminality and the 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 theory that you mentioned, I would call degenerationism, was a was a kind of theory that there was a sort of criminal breed whereby there was a group of people who were kind of undergoing reverse evolution and becoming worse and they were kind of inbred criminals. And so I read James Bruce Thompson's articles and this absolutely unshakable certainty that he has that you mentioned, Joe. I mean, that comes through absolutely in his article. He's not a, he's not a gentleman troubled by doubt. And um, I, I use those articles as a way of um, formulating his characters. And, uh, I, I, you know, I think um, I think there's still a lot, uh, a lot of debate around the, the validity of, you know, theories of criminology, theories of, you know, um, psychiatric... You know, expert witnesses at trial. Um, uh, James Rousseau himself is not troubled by any ethics in terms of what he does because he has this such great certainty in his own views. Um, we 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 don't obviously want to go into exactly what he says at the trial, um, but yeah, I mean, all I was all I was really uh, trying to do at this point was to take the, the prevalent theories of the time, and it was a it was a time. When uh, 
thinking about criminality was actually quite progressive in some ways. And there was a recognition that um, if somebody was acting under the, uh, was deemed to be insane um, while they committed whatever act it was, they were therefore not responsible for their actions. That had come in in the 1840s. And that's still the case now. So there was actually, there, were, there are elements of progressive, progressive thinking in James Ruth Thompson. Uh, so there's a kind of weird mix. And you know, what I always want to achieve, I think, in any of my books is a degree of ambiguity. So that you're, you're, not, you're not being presented with somebody who's wholly bad or wholly wrong. You might agree with some aspects and not other aspects. And that, I think that's a point where people become uh, much more engaged with, with a novel because at no point in this book do I, as the author, tell the reader what to think. And um, I never want to tell the reader what to think. And as a reader, I don't want an author to tell me what to think. I like to make up my own mind. So James Bruce Thompson presents his view, but I'm not asking the reader to agree with that view. I'm asking the reader to make up his or her own mind mm. whether they agree with that view. I'm just presenting the view. I mean, slightly linked to that. I mean, it's an incredibly fair trial, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I was quite surprised by that. You, you think maybe it's going to head up for this guy to be stitched up or something. Um, so presumably you found in documents of the time that the Scottish legal system was, was good. The Scottish legal system was exemplary. I mean, we'd gone through the Scottish Enlightenment in the 18th century. Um, and uh, I read, you know, trials were not routinely recorded, but they were incredibly de reported in incredible detail in newspapers. And um, so I took the, you know, the legal research. Certain very high profile uh, trials were published almost verbatim in book form. And, you know, the procedures and so on were absolutely as as are described in, in the book and really unchanged from, from until now. I would think the difference would be that trials in those days were much swifter. Um, so a, a murder trial would take three or four or five days, maybe, uh, whereas probably today it would drag on for weeks. But um, the, the, the actual the, the structures and so on were, were absolutely as they are today. When I was looking into 19th century trials in Scotland, the holy grail for me was to find a trial that, uh, that had a case that had gone to trial whereby the plea was not guilty on the grounds of insanity. Of course, I'm not an academic. I couldn't say this definitively, but in the, my experience of looking through those, these trial documents, most of the time when a plea of insanity was put forward, it was accepted by the judge or the prosecution and the trial did not then go on to actual trial. Uh, so it would have been unusual for that to come before the jury. But absolutely, um, it was a valid uh, plea as it is now. I want to go back a little bit because there's something that you said about ambiguity. And I think a lot of that arises from quite specifically the order in which documents are presented to you in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering whether that was something you had thought of during writing. I think it would have made such a difference, for example, if the medical testimony had been given ahead of Roderick's memoir or, you know, the fact that you had read Roderick's memoir meant that when you when you read um, uh, James Bruce Thompson's um, article, you were much more inclined to think of him as a as a classist snob because you had this sort of outpouring of empathy for Roderick in the aftermath. No, the, the, the order in which the, the documents are presented is, of course, um, very important. I mean, when I started writing the book, I kind of imagined it almost being presented as a dossier and somebody could read the different parts. It almost could be presented in a box mm. when you, with, you could take them out and read them in whatever order. And I still love, kind of love that idea. I wanted, I wrote Roddy's memoir, um, but I wanted that to be an immersive novelistic experience. I mean, it's probably runs to about 50,000 words, I think, that part of the book. And I, I think at that point, the reader um, forgets about the, the rest of the structure of the book. And they, we own, we see the world from the point of view of Roderick McRae. And we, um, the vast, vast majority of readers that I've encountered absolutely empathize with Roddy at this point of the book. And again, this is, goes to the point where, um, you know, when, when we're reading about the tribulations that Roddy and his family suffer, it's quite morally simplistic. Lachlan McKenzie is bad. 
and Roddy and his family are good. And when Roddy goes to take his vengeance against Lachlan, um, Lachlan McKenzie, we can, we're kind of on his side. But that kind of moral simplicity doesn't really interest me. It becomes, to me, a much more interesting novel when suddenly we realise that Roddy has not told us the whole truth and perhaps he may even have misled us. And that places the reader in a much more ambivalent position about the character they've been reading and I think leads them to question the, the validity or the truth of what they've been told. Um, but to me, it's even now, it's very important to block out, uh, to try to second guess what how readers will respond. Um, because, this, you know, not only... Does that, do I think that impinges on the authenticity of what you're writing if you try to consider how people will respond to it? But also, every reader responds differently to what they're reading. You know, so it's quite an interesting relationship between the, the kind of way people respond. But I just don't think about the reader because I don't believe in the reader. There's no such thing as the reader. It's road to hell to, <laughs> to, to second guess, I think, you know. I'm quite, I'm quite surprised by that because I think one thing you do brilliantly uh, in both this and case study is wrong foot the reader. And and I'd imagine it'd be quite hard to wrong foot the reader without thinking about the reader. No, yeah, but I mean, it's I, I don't plan anything, you know. Um, I, I don't, I mean, when I set out, when I, when I started writing uh, His Bloody Project, I didn't know what was going to happen. I knew that Rodri, Roddy was going to commit a murder and I knew from early on that he was going to kill Lachlan McKenzie. That's all I knew. And I didn't know about the incidents and then it took lead up to that. And um, so in a, in a sense, I'm wrong footing myself. Okay. Um, you know, and um, uh, I, I, I feel that if I'm, if I was, if I was every writer, you will have just spoken to many, many writers, just as I am. Every writer goes about it in a different way. And, uh, you know, there's no wrong, right way or wrong way. But I don't want to write towards an end point because I feel if I write towards an end point, I won't encounter anything interesting on the way because I'll be focused on that point in the distance. And I want to be focused on what's happening. How is the character experiencing this scene at this moment? Does that co color of the sheet on the washing line remind him of his childhood when he looked out the, the window of his, you know, into the garden and so on? But of course, you know, you want you want readers to feel engaged and you want them to be there to be some change in view as the reader goes through the book, you know? Um, but I, 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 I don't know how that happens. It's a mystery to me. In the, but in the preface, you, which is written by this guy, uh, Graham McRae Burnett, it says, yeah. um, he's found these documents and uh, it includes the sentence, naturally I have come to my own view of the case. But I shall leave it to the reader to reach his or own, her own conclusion. Um, so three questions about that. Is that Graham McRae Burnett you? Yeah. Two, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, two um, did you reach your own view of the case? And three, do you expect the reader to know for sure or think they know for sure what happened? Um, well, first of all, GMB, uh, absolutely, it's me. Um, you know, so what an egotist I insert myself. I've inserted myself into all my own books. Um, terrible, terrible behavior. But yes, it, I would say that it's me. Um, do I have my own view of the case? You know, it's, it's again, it's a question I've been asked so often. You know, what is the, you are the author, tell us the truth. Yeah. Um, my answer is always here is the material. I have access to the same material as, as the reader. And we can interpret it and come to our own view. It's basically, the, the the central narrative question at the end of the book is: Is Roddy insane, or is he not? Do I have a view of that? I, I honestly, I, I, I see both sides of the argument. And um, so one so, day, so would, when you say naturally, I've come to my own view of the case, you, you haven't really. Yeah. It's very clever of you to pick up on that line, James. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I feel like a politician who's been uh, found, somebody's found an old tweet. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, have I come to my own view? Um, no, I haven't really. So, yeah, I probably should have, um, I should, probably should have been more equivocal. But uh, what's important to me is that the reader comes to their own view. And even if I did have my own view, I mean, I have a, I mean, I have a compassionate view towards Roddy, but then I also have to remind myself of the things he's done. And that, you know, that's very troubling. It's very troubling to have a compassionate view of somebody 
uh, who has committed acts which you would in no way condone. Can I can I ask a kind of adjacent question to that? Because I think one of the things um, that comes up in the book a lot is this idea of providence versus action or nature versus nurture. So, for example, Roderick's father, um, John McRae, accepts a lot of the hardships which befall him quite passively and he believes that it's not his it's not within his ability or um sort of right to to alter the course of events but Roderick to me seems like the only character in the book who actually comes very close to governing his own destiny even if this does lead him to like a terrible <laughs> terrible conclusion um and when he's writing his memoir he keeps trying to pinpoint the bit at which it all went wrong you know was it when his mother died was it you know because he fell in love with Flora who is Lachlan's daughter um do you think that such a moment you know a catalyst for all these events within the book exists or or do you believe more in that idea of um within the novel of kind of predetermined um events or destiny uh, I mean honestly it's such a great question I mean I I the the, the the sort of extent to which we as individuals, as humans, exert free will or agency over our own lives, to me, is the most fascinating question. I'm basically an absolutely unreconstructed existentialist, <laughs> and this is the question that fasc fascinates me. Uh, in, in relation to the idea of providence, um, you know, the West of Scotland at that time, and even to some extent, even now, or until relatively recently, absolutely enthralled to the sort of free church of scotland the church of scotland teaching again a calvinist view that there is no free will and and there's a great scottish phrase what's for you won't go by you what's mm. what is intended for you will not pass you basically you can have no if something's going to happen it's going to happen and there's nothing you can do about it and john mccray roderick's father has drunk very deeply of this ideology and it's an ideology which was um, imposed on the people by the church of scotland and by the free, the, uh, the free church of scotland and this is why in earlier earlier parts of scottish of a century when the Scot highland clearances were happening um you know the church stood by and said this is the this is the this is the fruit of your sins and it's sinful to resist and this is what John McRae represents. And yeah, this is where you're, it's a very interesting question. See, Roddy is kind of, he's beginning to kick against this philosophy. Maybe I do not have to accept my lot in life. Maybe I do not have to accept my station as this, the lowest of the low. And there's a moment in the, in the novel where he decides to leave the village and he goes yes. off and he walks up. And if you, I hope you'll both visit um, Applecross and Kodui because the, the pass that he refers to is a very famous pass called the Bial Knambo. And he walks to the top of that and he, he says something like, I had reached the limits of my universe. And he, he feels he is drawn back. And um, this was a, this is a mo the moment in the novel where he's kind of trying to exert a sort of existential free will and he finds he's not quite able to. So uh, yeah, when he... When he goes to kill Lachlan Mackenzie, his way of justifying it to himself is rather complicated. But he says uh, he 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 tells his lawyer that he um, he is going to Lachlan Mackenzie's thus armed to see what will happen, you know. And he's kind of trusting, putting himself in Providence's hands. If I take up these weapons and go there, if it's meant to be that I kill Lachlan Mackenzie, then Lachlan Mackenzie will die by my hand. Um, so, but is is that perhaps in Roddy's, Roddy is actually trying to justify to himself what he's doing by, you know, utilizing this sort of, I have no free will philosophy, yeah. when actually he is exerting free will. Um, so I don't have a definitive answer to that question, like all the others you've <laughs> asked me, but I, I think it's so central to the book and it's central to everything I've written, I think. But one thing that you seem to be very interested in is, Basically, how do you know if someone's mad? And it, 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 one of my little theories is, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, medicine set itself the quest of doing to the mind what it had already done to the body in the 19th century, which was identifying diseases, seeing how they worked and learning how to cure them. 
But when it came to the mind, they it, they didn't have the same success. You know, uh, e even now, you know, psychiatrists can't tell if someone's mad, and they can. You know, doctors can tell if someone's got cancer. And and the, you, the two books seem to be. So you've got one set at, at, at the dawn of this project, in a way, uh, his bloody project, and you've got case study when faith in this project is beginning to disappear. Uh, the, the, the project being, you know, can you tell if someone's mad? Um, I mean, that, is, that, is that an abiding interest? Um, it's absolutely an abiding interest. I mean, my initial um, encounter with the, the, the ideas of what constitutes madness, I think, again, when I was back as a student in Glasgow University, I came across Foucault's book, Madness and Civilization, as it's called in English, uh, his, his Histoire de la Folie, I believe in French. And, you know, that was a book which made me, for the first time, question the idea of madness as a sort of fixed set of characteristics. And what Foucault shows in the book, and I'm not an expert, is that in different societies and cultures, our ideas of, of madness is completely changeable. So if, if you live in a theocracy, um, somebody who doesn't believe in the sort of prevailing religion would be described as heretic or mad and deemed to be mad. If you live in a sort of high capitalist society and you're very poor, the poor can be deemed to be mad and so on. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm very suspicious of designations of madness um, and as I remain so. And I think there's still a lot of uh, extremely relevant debates going on about how um, medical practitioners um, and psychiatrists diagnose people who may or may not, you know, the, the word mad is probably not used very much anymore, but um, but people, there's, there can be a rush to diagnosis for so-called conditions that may actually just be part of the normal experience of life. Uh, in, uh, indeed, and 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 uh, maybe we should say a little bit more about case study because we haven't really explained it. This this is set in the nineteen sixties with a again a, a brilliant blend of real people, and so the Beatles are in there, Joan Bakewell's in there. Uh, the main character, who I'm sure loads of people must have googled, Collins Braithwaite, uh, seems to be a, a sort of psych, trendy psychiatrist or psychiatrist of the day. Um, did 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 you find that people were googling Collins Braithwaite thinking he was real too? When I wrote case study, I was pretty sure that almost every reader would Google Collins Braithwaite, and um, who, as you say, is a sort of charismatic psychotherapist and a, a charlatan and a very toxic kind of individual, um, but really questioning the practices of mainstream psychiatry at the time. And he, Collins Braithwaite, absolutely embraces the idea of that we are a kind of multiplicity of selves and that no one of these selves is more authentic than the other. Um, and the, the book, you know, running through the book case study is the sort of the sort of trope of adopting of personae. All all the characters in the book really have two personae, and um, you know, the question I suppose that arises is which which of these personas is the more real and which is more authentic. Uh, when you find that people are, uh, are googling Collins Braithwaite, or when you find that his bloody project is being filed by bookshops under true crime. Do you think score one for me, <laughs> or, do, um, or, or, or do you think oh, that's, a, that's a bit annoying that people don't understand my work? Well, the first the first review of uh, um, the first review of his bloody project actually reviewed it as a true crime book, um, and many many readers over the years have c come to me and asked me, did it really happen? Is this true? And I just take it as a compliment to the writing of the book that I was able to write fifty thousand words in the voice of a seventeen year old crofter and. To convince people that it was true, I think that's that's kind of all you can ask as a novelist is for people to buy so deeply into the, the world you've created that they think is real. Um, so true crime. I, I just want my books to be on the shelf. You know, I don't really mind which one it is. I think that's fair enough. Are you yeah. a true crime fan yourself? Um, no, no, I'm not. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I used to. I used to. But I had a phase many many years ago reading about you know some of the there's some really salacious and unpleasant uh, work written about murderers but there's a few really really good books um i mean the work of um gordon burns books on uh, peter sutcliffe and the west are absolutely tremendous examples of that um but i'm not i don't listen to true crime podcasts and so on um even although 
I quite often get kind of thrown into that mix. <laughs> Sorry, thanks, Graham. That's very much. Are you one of these writers who will or won't tell us what you're working on now? Um, well, um, I, I've written uh, two novel set in a small town in France um, featuring this detective called Gorsky. And they're kind of sort of crime novels, but not really. And um, I'm writing the final part of the trilogy at the moment. Oh, OK. Well, well good luck with that, Graham. Uh, any, when, when will that be out? I, I would love it to be out in 2024, but um, that depends on me getting my finger out. <laughs> Anima, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you both. And it's, it's, thank you so much for featuring the book. That's it for this week. If you haven't already followed the show, please do. And remember to leave a rating. You can find out more about our September Book of the Month is Bloody Project by Graham McRae Burnett at thebookerprizes.com. And remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Substack at The Book of Prizes. Thanks again to our special guest, Graham McRae Burnett. And do let us know what you thought of his Bloody Project. Next week, we'll, we'll be releasing the podcast on Friday, not Thursday, so that we can reveal to you all of this year's Booker Prize shortlist. We'll also be debating the best Booker shortlist ever with a rather like unexpected surprise guest, I think. Would you say, James? Uh, yeah, a guy who's um, not only read every book that's ever been Booker shortlisted, but more, even more astonishing to me, he seems to have remembered them all. Uh, an amazing guy called Bob Jackson, so he'll be joining us next week. Until then, goodbye. Bye. The Booker Prize podcast is hosted by Joe Hamia and me, James Walton. It's produced and edited by Kevin Miolo. And the executive producer is John Davenport. It's a Daddy Supiot production for the Booker Prizes.